Hey, Bob WP here, and welcome to Woo Dev Chat, a Do the Woo podcast show. This show is brought to you by Avalara, who wants to help developers make sure their Woo projects are tax compliant and done right with Avalara's API. I'll tell you more about Avalara later in the show, but let's dive into today's Woo Dev Chat. Well, hello there. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. How are you? Hey, Marcel. I'm good. And yourself? I am wonderful. It's September. Summertime is ending. Um, vacation was just a couple of weeks ago. So I guess in, in the more perfect mood you can get in, in the year. <laughs> yeah, the, the gray weather has really shown us that summer might be over. I think we'll get a second wave, right, usually. Yeah, it seems it's going to be some cool weather coming. There's something in Portugal called um, Verão de São Martinho that's basically saying that there is a special uh, time of the year uh, in October where there's just this little extra sun coming in and, and warm weather that gives you like a last goodbye kiss of the summer. And uh, it seems like this year we're going to have it a little bit earlier than, than October. Oh, well. Today, we're going to go ahead and talk about WooCommerce and hosting, uh, the critical aspects for anyone running an online store in WordPress. And um, like unlike a, a regular WordPress site, WooCommerce introduces, um, I guess, unique challenges to, to the, the dynamic of the nature of e-commerce, things like uh, product catalogs, customer data, and orders, and uh, all of which uh, place more demands on your hosting environment, right? And the right hosting can mean the difference between a smooth shopping experience or a sluggish website, I guess. Um, Sales are directly um, affected by a good hosting. So I guess we could break down a little bit um, what our listeners need to know to ensure that WooCommerce sites performs as its best. And okay, let's, let's, um, let's kick things off by discussing we keep talking about performance here, Mike. I feel like this is the third episode or fourth episode that the word performance is going to come out like multiple times a minute or an episode. Um, and I, I, I don't want it. I don't want this to be maybe yet another episode about performance and how important this and this and this and that. But having that said, the only or the, not the only, but the main um, task of a good hosting service is effectively to, pro- to provide performance to your website, right? So performance is actually crucial for both the user experience, SEO, for sales results and all of that. Um, if the store loads slowly, with, uh, the visitors will leave before making a purchase. Uh, search engines may rank you as a lower result. So it's definitely a key factor in performance. The the hosting and the server response time and, and all of that, right? Um, as a general rule, or um, like if you had 30 seconds to give somebody good advice about hosting, what, what would you say? Um, pick something with enough resources and tools and quality support to help you through any challenges that may arise as part of being an e-commerce store owner. And those, like what you said, is a very good list. I I would add um, employee productivity. Mm -hmm. I have some clients who are like have 10 people in the back end processing orders all the time, right? Like that's all uncashed. It requires a lot of resources and checking in the database um, for stuff. And then also business to business um, components, right? Like if they're, APIs that your your business needs to talk to another business that's fetching information, that's going to require resources um, as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think, yeah, those are those three things. I think are the most important: the the poor quality tools and resources. Without those, uh, you're going to be sacrificing some kind of quality overall, whether it's for your users, your employees, or for your own. Um, you know, if you're a stakeholder, profits and stuff like that. Right, right. And and when you when you say support tools, um, are you also do you also mean 
the actual support service that a hosting company provides, um, not only whatever you can get through a dashboard of some sorts, but also talking to somebody, is, is that important to you? Yeah, definitely. I think talking to support staff, if you've worked with WooCommerce for long enough, is generally one of the most like, uh, oh, like, how is this going to go? It could either go really well, you get someone who's enthusiastic and interested in um, troubleshooting together, finding solutions, and then you have other support staff who are like, there's nothing we can do, or they try and point the finger somewhere else and um, are not trying to help you directly with the issue. And then as well as that too, it's um, having the tools available to do troubleshooting, like having the command line access uh, with SSH, PHP, my admin or similar um, tools to be able to investigate things in the database, new relic or other things for gathering rich amounts of data. I know some service hosting companies have their own APM tool and they have their own in-house scripts that they have built over time to help you scan logs and look for patterns and that kind of stuff. So I think yeah, both are really important. Yeah, that's why I asked you, because in our freelance work that we do, sometimes we need to sort of like uh, do the job of a good um, host um, support agent and um, sort of like translate it, let the client know what the issue is or might be and um, just do a little bit the breach that uh, one has to do between support and, and our client. Because sometimes... Support will say, yeah, this is this plugin that is running slow. This is this other thing. And you should contact your developer and stuff like that. And and sometimes they're right, but sometimes it seems like they're they're definitely lazy about investigating the issue. But I think there are a couple of, well, this is getting better from time to time. I guess competition is responsible for improving all of these uh, services. Um, and, and there are some really good, like you said, that they have their own tools and they're very quick and immediately identify what the issue is. Or being proactive as well, maybe mentioning that your website is running slow. There's a, um, a long running task occupying a lot of CPU power and they go ahead and, and inform the client about it. All of this, I think it's super important, right? Yeah, yeah I like the, you, you just reminded me, there's a few hosts that they'll send out emails if there's been a 502 bad gateway or 504 timeout, right? Or, hey, we found malware or you're running this plugin version that is a, has a known security vulnerability, right? So I think the proactivity is one of the most attractive components of a, a hosting company for sure. Right. So I, I guess if we would begin establishing like a list of all the things that people should look out for a hosting company, um, well, besides price and CPU power and memory and all of that, I guess one of the most important factors is really how support works and what support provides in terms of service when, when things um, go wrong or when you need help or when we need advice. So yeah, before committing to uh, any health service, just try to figure out a little bit more about how support provides. Because I, th I personally think it's probably the most important thing you can get. I mean, if, if the memory is low, that support guy will tell you increase memory and it will work, right? Or if CPU is, is not enough, add more CPU power to your hosting or, or this or that. So it's always going to end up being in, in supports uh, the information that you're looking for when you have difficulties and managing hosting um, and leveraging what is the best plan and uh, what I need and etc is something that it will is a decision that it will make today probably in a month's time or in a year time when your store grows you're gonna have to revisit all of those choices again and you're gonna have to fine-tune the hosting service that you just hired to be more efficient for your um, successful store that we're running. And um, so that's not that much important at the beginning, I would say. Yeah, I agree. I think if you, like I said, if you have enough resources and things are performing well, things are smooth, then there's not too much to worry about. But as hopefully the store is growing and being successful and uh, you then have to adapt over time and it's really useful to have support staff at the hosting company who can help you assess what your needs actually are resource what to be able to accommodate as every store is different right like i think you, we've both seen plenty of them and there's always just a little you know they're never ever exactly the same there's always a few uh differences 
And when, and when you see those pricing tables, they usually talk about the bandwidth, the CPUs, and this and this. And some of them do um, mention a couple of support services or support nuances. But talking to actually somebody before committing to a hosting service is a good idea. Or maybe asking other people or the community or any social media for advice on that. But having that said, okay, so now let's see. We've, we've uh, talked about the support. It's important. Um, the the different places where the data centers are and, and the different areas of the world the hosting service um, covers is also important, especially for stores. If you want to have a very fast running store and if you're operating worldwide, it's important for you to know where that hosting service has their data center so that you can expand um, your assets or different resources to those data centers. But let's dive into more specifically really what's the importance about memory, disk speed, PHP workers, caching systems, database optimization, security backups, and scalability at the end. So let's start with um, the memory. Um, I will just introduce very quickly how important memory is. And Mike, maybe I, I'll propose you this format. I give you a statement about what memory is and how important it is to commerce. And you either agree or disagree with me um, and add your, your points to it. Sounds good? Sounds good. All right. So uh, if we talk about memory, um, why is memory important? We know that WooCommerce requires more memory, more RAM than a typical WordPress site because it's all dynamic contents, right? We have products, we have reviews, shopping carts, we have customer data. So if you're running a small store, maybe one or two gigabytes of RAM may be sufficient. But for larger stores and high traffic websites, you would need four, eight, 10, 12, 16, I don't know, to run just to make sure everything runs smoothly, right? And without uh, enough RAM, your server could become very overwhelmed. It could have slowing down pages uh, and the cause of crashes, um, which is obviously the last thing that you want to have. Um, what do you think about RAM? How important is RAM? Yeah, it's really important for sure. Like if, uh, especially for the database, you know, if you don't have enough RAM for the database then uh queries will time out or get terminated and that can cause all kinds of weird issues where things didn't get synchronized or didn't add to a queue that needed to be you know processed later um and then you also have ph some plugins use a lot of ram right so you need to, one of the things you we often have to adjust is the memory limit in php so that certain uh, tasks and execute. So those, it's one of those things you can't, uh, you can't oversell if you start to use on hosting with, if you start to allocate more RAM than physically, that's when that was physically available. Um, it just, it won't work. And if you try and use virtual memory, right. If you remember back in the day, right, we would put, we would have like RAM disc and, and stuff like that. And that's, uh, just RAM is always going to be faster than hard drives, even if I don't think SSDs will ever get, eventually maybe SSDs will just be <laughs> RAM chips. That, that would be cool, but I have a feeling that's quite expensive. And, and RAM specifically has um, has to have the ability to quickly read, write, read, write in, in, a, in a way and in a speed that um, SSDs are not designed to, to do. Um, if we would have a world where SSDs and RAM would be the same ship, I guess the only company I built could be able to do that would be Apple, but uh, jokes aside, it's 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 sort of like every every one of these two components have their own uh, uh, um, job to do in, in in the environment. You talked about database and the RAM importance for the database, but there's also the PHP side of it, right? So when you're working with RAM, RAM is basically shared between two main uh, things database and the PHP. Um, so PHP, when it runs, it needs memory to do its calculation. And when it's done, it just serves the results to the uh, web server, which then displays to the client, right? So having PHP tasks that also take a lot of memory is also important in this case. Uh, but that is fairly easy to to measure and to know. And if you have a task that, um, PHP task that takes a lot of memory, then that's usually a bad sign. So increasing memory to cover up PHP um, 
memory um, leaks uh, is not a, a good thing to do, but it's also an important part of, of the process. I agree. Um, then we have um, disk, uh, disk speed, right? So the disk is another critical factor, uh, particularly when you're uh, handling large amounts of data. And we know that with WooCommerce, we can get that. Um, but basically for WooCommerce, I guess SSDs, the solid state drives, are almost always a better choice than the traditional HDDs. And SSDs are mainly faster to read and write data, which is especially important for large uh, WooCommerce stores uh, with, I would say, thousands of products or images or orders or customers. So having SSD can uh, significantly improve uh, silos uh, times, um, which obviously are crucial for keeping customers engaged. Um, We've, we are old enough to have been around the transition from HDDs to SSDs in the hosting world, right? Was that the same for you? Like, thank God we already have SSDs for hosting. And did that, in your experience, provide a huge uh, performance impact? It, yeah, I mean, nowadays, right, like you wouldn't ever choose a host that didn't use solid state drives because, um, yeah, it's directly related to performance and uh, database like you want the database stored on SSD, not in uh, not a hard drive, like uh, the old school ones. I can't. I, I'm pretty sure there are instances where I've witnessed this happen, usually from like very low cost um, hosting on a machine that was older than it should have been for being allowed to be in the <laughs> web <laughs> hosting space, and then you move them somewhere that uses modern technology and the client is like, whoa, like, you know, my time to first bite used to be 15 seconds and now it's, you know, a second, right? And they're like, they are like, I cannot believe that that makes that big of a difference. Um, so if you are lucky enough to find a client site that's still using a, an old school hard drive and you move an SSD, I'm sure you see a significant boost. I guess nowadays HDDs in, in a hosting environment are used for more static data or for uh, large data sets that you don't provide them specifically in a dynamic way to a web server. It would be more considered about saving data files that are um, just accessed sporadically. And so you do see some hosting companies offering uh, this large amounts of hosting space um, for the specific use, and they are usually using HDDs because there is still this discussion around which one of those two different types of drives are the, the, the last the longer, right? Because SSDs are more prone to fail, I guess, than HDDs. But then again, we have bad experiences um, with HDDs as well if you uh, mess with them too much or if they... Well, when they're in the hosting environment, nobody will, will touch them, but they, they are also very sensible to movements and to to heat and other factors, right? I do remember the, the time where we had this transitions from HDDs to SSDs on our personal computers, especially on um, the people who had Apple computers in early... Uh, around 2012, 2011, 2012, where there was a tradition, a transition between SS, um, HDDs and SSDs, and people were buying these external SSDs and, and putting them into the USB uh, connection and just booting off of the SS, external SSDs. And, and some of, of the people also like tweaked the computers and opened them up and installed the SSDs inside and replaced uh, for the HDD. And we we got huge improvements in in speed, and and suddenly the operating system was loading. We would say as it seemed like it would be running off the memory only. There would be no hard drive. And I guess we can say the same for, for hosting, right? So files being read very quickly is a lot more efficient for hosting. Yeah, definitely. I do remember there's one there's one hosting company that they had I'd brought a client that had so much um so much images. It was it was like an Android uh, news website, right? So they had so many images and they needed terabytes and terabytes. It was insane how much this was. And uh, we ended up, because the SSDs were going to be so expensive, we ended up um, using hard drives in a RAID uh, or something like that. And 
because it was just for the images, like obviously you want to read the images as quickly and as possible as, as well, similar to the database, but it was the only way that they could have a sustainable long-term growth because of how, how much the, uh, the image library grew every day. Um, they needed something that made sense for the next, you know, 10 years at least. Um, so yeah, I would just add that that's a, it's an important little, little piece too. They still have their place, right? Like my Synology NAS, and you have one as well, right? Where they, I chose a uh, Western digital red hard drives for the, the enterprise thingies. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they're designed to run for, uh, all 24 seven and also, um, last the longest, right? I think SSDs, they have a, un- they have a limited number of rights, right? Isn't that the, the main? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's some calculations around how many times they can read and write, and and which defines their um, lifetime cycle. Yeah, yeah. Whereas hard drives are not unlimited, but it's like you know you'll be you have other problems um, at that point. You you probably won't be alive anymore. Exactly. All right. Um, that's um the disk uh, topic. Let's talk about another topic. Um, and let's talk about PHP workers, which is. Not every hosting company discloses how how many PHP workers one can get when we do a hosting plan with them. But basically, and I think they're all, uh, often overlooked, but they're a very essential aspect of a hosting for WooCommerce specifically. So um, for everyone listening and who doesn't know what PHP workers are in simple terms, they handle the simultaneous process that you on your website. So let's Things like, for example, multiple users adding car a product uh, to their cards or checking out at the same time. So if you don't have enough PHP workers, your site will um, slow down right during business business times. And because um, there aren't enough resources to process all the requests, people are going to wait for the requests to process. So from the time that you ask for a specific URL, and by the time you get the result delivered, that's the time that the hosting will spend doing some sort of work, calculating some result for you to show on the website. And PHP workers are essentially the uh, processes that take that request, they process it, they run the PHP script, and they deliver the, the, the page that you're requesting, right? So those 200 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, they're going to be busy doing something. So if you have 10 people coming in, there's going to be ev- eventually a queue, and people are going to be waiting for their turn to get the process running, to get the PHP worker running. So um, if you think it like a restaurant, if there aren't enough waiters, service gets slow, it's kind of the same thing. Um, PHP workers are expensive for hosting companies, and they are also expensive for the resources that you have on your hosting side, but they are an important part of it. Um, wh- what's your take on PHP workers? Yeah, I I wanted to add the to the waiter um, example is you have service will slow down, but you also get people leaving, which would be like a five hundred two bad gateway, right? Where it's like <laughs> there's not enough service, I'm leaving um, with a bad review. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, which is what happens if a visitor comes to your site to try and buy something, and you just see an error message, right? Five hundred two bad gateways. Like, oh, then they just leave. They, you know, some people will be patient and try and reload, but right. Tension is harder and harder to maintain these days. Avalara wants to make sure that your projects go smooth, and part of that includes doing it right with their API. Their resources cover it all to help your clients manage sales and use, excise, GST, VAT, and other tax types across the U.S. and abroad. You'll find it all on their site, and you'll be learning more on how they can help you during their sponsorship of Woo Dev Chat. Want to learn more? Just go to developer.avalera.com. Why do you think the hosting companies, they don't disclose how many PHP workers they have? Um, I think it's, it's a tricky thing to uh, make equal. It's kind of, it's very related to CPU and also the way that your site functions. So, I think it can be misleading to, for example, say you have 32 uh, virtual CPUs, right? Um, and you have, you know, five, 500 PHP workers. 
the CPU cores and PHP workers, in my experience, are not created equally across hosting spaces. Because CPU um, is something that you can oversell and split. So if I have a 32 physical CPU cores, I can easily split that into um, 20 or 30 virtual machines that have four or eight CPUs and the it will just split and make them weaker um, between them, right? Whereas if you, the, the kind of hosting I really like is when it's a physical dedicated machine and you're not using virtual CPUs at all. And the PHP workers from that kind of machine tend to be way more powerful um, and in executing uh, script and stuff compared to ones on uh, oversold uh, VPS sort of style hosting. And, and PHP workers, because they work simultaneously on, on, a, on a specific task, they, they are consuming CPU resources. And it, it's, it, it's sort of like you would make feel like, okay, so I have four cores, so I can have at least four PHP workers, but I could also have eight PHP workers. We could split each core between two PHP workers. But the more PHP workers you add, the slower them themselves will run because they're concurrently running and doing their task. And so that will eventually also s slow down. Uh, every you will serve more people at the same time, but everybody will get a slower response at the end of the day. So it's not a linear thing. It, it doesn't seem like the more PHP workers you have, the faster it will go. There's some certain, s certain limit. So that's why I think also um, hosting companies don't disclose uh, their PHP workers because it's a game of uh, being um, the best performant, but also not just wasting a lot of resources in PHP worker when that's not clearly needed on. That's not the case, right? And also, there's there's some sort of like an an energy consumption worry behind this as well. You don't just simply want to have a bunch of um, processes running all the time. Uh, so it's it's kind of like a, a game. But some of the hosting companies do provide those numbers and they do a marketing offering uh, according to PHP workers. And the more that they're offered doesn't always mean the, the faster the hosting site. Yeah, very true. And it, it also depends a lot on the nature of the site and what it's doing. So I remember a, a client who they did a lot of uncached activity. So the idea was you would land on a website and then you, they had a single sign-on thingy that you could connect your uh, your login to, and it would make an API request to a third party to authenticate, and then it would let you go shopping for some exclusive deals or whatever. And um, we were doing load testing to get ready for the holiday season because it was a for a very very large company, and uh, we found that they were running out of PHP worker threads. And uh, even though we had a dedicated server with a, with a huge amount of um, resources and the CPU was basically flat, the RAM was not going that high and but PHP workers were running out and we were getting errors. And I had a long discussion with the hosting company to say, look, like, we're yes, we're, we're using that lane, right? Like, yeah, we're, we're sort of like keeping a, a, a waiter at the table, but it's because we're waiting for information from, you know, we're taking an order from a friend who's running late, right? And we just want to, we're waiting for the feedback from them to give to the, the waiter. So it's not like the waiter is, is stressed or like carrying a lot of plates necessarily or whatever. It's, it's just sort of being idle and, and waiting for, for, uh, for information to come back. And I think that's an important part that like, if the PHP worker is not actively processing a lot of information and like, you know, you picture the waiter is running around constantly, sometimes they're just idle, not doing much. And it's okay to allocate more PHP worker threads in situations like that. If you're monitoring the system and you can see that it's not stressed, you know, if CPU and RAM are uh, showing very low levels of um, usage, then you can ramp up the PHP workers. But if in the, the opposite way, if you have, I remember one of the, the first VPSs I ever provisioned and set up, it had, you know, one CPU core, right? And 512 megabytes of, of RAM. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, I was determined to run things on as few resources as possible and just rely on caching because it was a very cash friendly website. It wasn't a WooCommerce store. And um, I, I just in- kept increasing the PHP worker threads available, the, the you know, MPM max children. And you can put it as high as you want. But then um, when I did load testing for uncached responses, the server froze completely, you know, and when I have SSH in, the load number was like, you know, 200 and something, which it should be, should be as close to one or one times the number of CPU cores that you have. Uh, it was just like, you know, you could just put, imagine these poor waiters. They're like, <laughs> um, there were, there was a lot of very, very tiny waiters, um, carrying a lot of stuff and that none of them knew where they were going anymore. They were all confused and, uh, the, the queue just got so backed up. I would imagine if this podcast would include video, we would put up a uh, like sort of like a graphic of tiny waiters in in multiple restaurants and just running around and being uh, unorganized, and then it would be very interesting to to organize that. We, we I completely forgot. So, like we we've been talking about importance of RAM and this space and PC workers, but we're not naming numbers, right? So I I would try to like give people a little bit of a, some ideas of what. The numbers are for each of these individual uh, components. Let's call it that that the hosting company can offer, and I guess uh, and I'll I'll name some numbers and, and then you correct me if if you if you're um, if I'm good with my numbers or not. But this this is basically like the same thing like with engines in a car, right? If you have BMW, for example, they're famous to be have this big engines. They have three liters, four liters engines, and you just throw a bunch of gasoline in it, the explosion is huge. They have this thick engine walls that can handle all the explosion. Then you have super power. You have a lot of power because you really just have thick walls and a lot of gasoline exploding inside their, those cylinders, right? So that's one way to do it. Let's call it the easy way. It's not an easy way to, co- to have a very big control explosion inside a cylinder, but let's call it easy. The, the more um, tricky way is to have a one liter engine or a one at 1.5 liter engine and have an explosion that has almost the same kind of force or power that has this bigger explosion. But because you've adapted the shape of the cylinder, but because you made it a special mixture between air and, and combustion and all of that, because you've, you've took a little bit more time into figuring out how to almost get the same kind of force with a lot less energy. I guess that's a little bit the uh, comparison that we're making here, right? You can obviously have 16 gig of RAM and 16 CPUs and a lot of this space and everything would run smoothly. Yes, but is that efficient? Do you need all of that? Are you using your BMW to drive five kilometers to take your kid to a school? Or do you do 300 kilometers every day and you really need that strong engine to, to work in your ways, right? So having that in mind and taking into consideration that everything is running smoothly, you don't have custom code that is just occupying a lot of resources, I would say less than uh, 50 concurrent users, two gigabyte, two gigabytes of RAM is enough. If you have 100 to 200 concurrent users, I think four gigabytes and more than 200 concurrent users, it would be eight plus 16 gigabytes. I, I think this is a good number. Would you agree with uh, these numbers? I think those are probably safe starting points, uh, assuming the database is not huge, right? That would be my one of my one caveat, right? If you have a 20 gigabyte database, then you're going to want to start with at least 32 gigs of RAM, I'd say, or, or more. Uh, but yeah, that I think, and then load test that uh, now, you know, people are getting prepared for the holiday season. Black Friday is coming up and I would load test, um, the, the most resource hungry scenarios you can think of in terms of the marketing. Uh, stuff you're doing, whether it's newsletters or paid traffic on uh, Meta or Google or whatever it is, and see, we're doing something right now with a client, and once they get to 200 users, uh, things are not going well. So we're finding the identifying the bottlenecks with new click and uh, coming up with strategies of how to um, how to mitigate them. And and the strategy is definitely not just okay. Let's just double RAM and everything is good, right? Because that's also a cost that people have to take into consideration. You don't have infinite money to pay these resources and and just be happy with it, right? Yeah, I think during the holiday season is where people tend to be more open to the idea of just throwing resources at the problem. It's certainly the 
the easiest, um, you know, easiest solution, even if it costs more, usually it's going to be worth it because if your site is crashing, you're not making as much money for sure. Um, but yeah, like I, 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 in general, I don't like the idea of, oh, just keep throwing resources out until it works properly. You know, I think you and I would go and identify what is taking so long. Does that code optimize correctly? Yeah, is there a way to rewrite it so it's it's more intelligent the way that it processes data and uh, using less RAM and, and stuff like that? So, And it's a lot more intelligent and rewarding if you figure out what's consuming that much resource. And then suddenly with the same kind of resources, you just double the speed of the website. There's something special about achieving that, right? Obviously, if, you, if you're time constrained and you're, the special decision is coming and okay, let's add some more RAM for this next three months and then we figure out later, fine. But the figuring out later part needs to happen some sometime. Yeah, I it's, you know, websites are just like a, a house or an F1 car. Like you can't just keep adding stuff to it or turning something on and forgetting you left it on, right? Like if you have a basement and you turn the water on to, to do some sort of task and then you got distracted and left it on and you're adding more and more resources to be able to accommodate a flood that you don't need for any business purposes you know um it's i think that's really important because a lot of the times when i do investigations you know but the thing that is gobbling up cpu or ram or disk space is a feature that they tested once upon a time is no longer used the person at the company who suggested it is no longer with the company or whatever. Um, so I think this sort of like uh, website hygiene, you know, maintenance stuff is just so, so important. Uh, also from, and hosting companies can help you with that, right? If you're um, good hosting companies will tell you if you're about to run out of hosting, uh, sorry, disk space. Because without disk space, uh, nothing will work. <laughs> you won't be able to do database operate. You won't be able to log into your, your WordPress site. You might you might not be able to SSH into your hosting and, and do anything in there. Yeah. Yeah. You can usually SSH in, but you running commands will just give you weird output. You're what do you mean? No. You know, I can't it's a it's a very funny experience. So And the same thing with RAM, right? So if you if you run out of RAM and you need just, just a little extra to run some command to just basically kill something or just something that's the same thing. As far as CPUs are concerned, 50 concurrent users to CPUs, I guess it's a good number for 100 and 200 concurrent users for CPUs. And to more than 200 consumers, you would you, you will need eight CPUs, I would say. It's a, it's a round number or, or more given. But um, do you agree with those numbers as well? I, in general, I, I'd say they're probably good starting points. It's going to depend, again, on how many of those people are or window shopping versus putting something in their cart, right? Like, um, I think if you're, you have caching set up properly that, uh, and you don't have, you know, a huge product catalog where every user is visiting different products, you know, if you have a small catalog and you set up caching correctly, then uh, you can have tons, you can have hundreds or thousands of uh, window shoppers. So as soon as people are adding items to the cart, then the majority of caches are bypassed. And depending on how your site is uh, is tuned, um, you know that that could. We've seen this plenty of times where code is running unnecessarily, and as uh, for uncached visitors, you know WordPress runs a lot of functions, plugins execute a lot of code that doesn't need to be, and that can slow things down. So, and as far as PHP workers are concerned, I would say on the same scale so for fifty concurrent users too. 100 to 200 concurrent users, I would say four PHP workers and more than 200, 10 PHP workers. Yeah, you could start with those and see see what happens. Um, yeah. Let's talk about the big um, elephant in the room, caching systems. <laughs> caching is uh, definitely one of the most effective ways to improve the performance, right, in a commerce store. Um, there are different types of caching. Um, there's page caching which uh, saves a static version of your website. But we all know that WooCommerce stores can only have that many static versions uh, of pages. Not all pages can be static, like in a regular page. Uh, and those will be delivered without uh, making your server uh, do all the work from scratch, right? 
Then you have object caching, you have Redis, Memcache, you have um, those would help you with uh, database queries. You have the browser caching, so the client side can also do some some caching um, to save uh, the resources locally on the user's devices. You have uh, OP caching or UP code caching. You have um, yeah a bunch of different caching system to reduce the load on the server. Uh, I was thinking about posting you uh, asking you this question: How important is caching to you? But it's it's sort of like a stupid question, and so, but I, I would rather ask you the experience that you have been having with your most recent clients um, and uh, taking into consideration that the um, hosting also can provide some caching solutions and having in consideration the hosting services you've worked with. Do you think there's a hosting server who does it right, who nails the caching system for a WooCommerce setup? Um, My answer is no, by the way. I would say it's it's really difficult to do it perfectly for because all stores are different right so um i would say that the best you can really expect from a hosting company is that they provide the tools and configuration possibilities uh, necessary to be able to set up caching correctly for your site um i think that most hosts do a decent job of setting up things where you know the, the cart and checkout are excluded that um co- the cookies are are excluded that need to be like the items in cart one and and stuff like that um edge caching is becoming more and more popular now thanks to like cloudflare enterprise uh, integration is becoming easier so you get to take advantage of that which reduces time to first byte across the different uh, locations so, um, I would say that no, no hosting company gets it perfectly correct, but I think a lot of them have a good, uh, starting point, like a good springboard for you to be able to configure things yourself. Um, I saw a hosting company recently that helped their client cache login users for WooCop or where it was. I thought it was really clever because you, you know, caching login just sounds like dark black magic. Um, but their business model was such that people had to register an account and log in to be able to have access to the, the product catalog. So everything was uncached otherwise. Right. Uh, but then once they, the, the way that they did it was really clever. It was, uh, you, they basically set up a caching rules list for the the product pages and did it by a special cookie so add things and certain user roles that didn't want to have the the login page caching enabled would set a special cookie and that would be automatically excluded and uh, all the other users who were who had registered an account to log in that had like the customer user role or whatever it was um, they would get cached versions of the pages and then a lot more PHP worker threads were available because before they were all being gobbled up by all the logged in users. And, um, that was only because the hosting company allowed you to make, you know, they, they, um, they had a developer, uh, not the hosting company, but the client, uh, developed this custom plugin to look for those cookies and, and stuff like that. And then the hosting company were able to make that implement the, the custom rules list for the different products the things could be cached for those and not cached for others. So it was really, um, it was really clever, right? So, and I think that's a, that's a special use case and I wouldn't expect every hosting company Perfect. to, that would be amazing, but that would be like a very expensive, you know, a white glove, uh, VIP. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the thing that is special though about WooCommerce is that some of the pages cannot be cached in the same way that others. So, the least that hosting companies need to be aware of when they're offering this WooCommerce specialized hosting services is that there are special pages within the the, word, the WooCommerce store environment and um, that you can also have yourself uh, develop some special pages that you want to insert exclusions for a certain type of caching. And so caching needs to be, the different types of caching need to be adapted to the nature of the store. Not only WooCommerce generally, but also if you want to add or remove some of the restrictions and so to make it your own rules. And I think that's an important part of the hosting service and when choosing a hosting provider that you know that you have a capability at least to talk to somebody to adapt to your 
different needs. And yeah, I think generally hosting services are getting better into accommodating those requests and making them really specialized for WooCommerce stores. Um, if you have the knowledge to do it yourself, you can still go to AWS or Google Cloud or whatever and, and configure all, all the things yourself, which um, congratulations if you have the time and the, the knowledge to do that as a store owner. But um, most of those techniques are now available online and most of them are so offered by the hosting companies uh, under the hood. So it's, uh, it's definitely something you need to, to um, take a look at. Let's talk very quickly about database optimization. This is one that site owners often overlook. Um, uh, since WooCommerce stores store a lot of data, and we talked about this in our previous episode, everything uh, from a customer to order history, and your database can get bloated, right, and slow things down. And regularly optimizing the database by removing transients or optimizing tables, um, they can make a big difference in performance. And uh, there are plugins that can help you with that. Uh, the hosting provider might also offer database optimization services. In um, 30 seconds, because I want to get to the end of all the topics that I have, Mike, what do you think, how, how important is database optimization? Um, I think it's similar to like disk space and other stuff. Like if you don't have an, an optimized uh, database, then it just can, you know, the poor post table has everything in it basically, right? Uh, at least it used to before HPOS uh, or HPOS. And uh, yeah, it's it's critical. Like if you want things, especially if you're growing, you need to have not extra crap in the database that you're sifting through for doing basic queries from, from WooCommerce and, and WordPress. It's just, it's not an optional thing. It's kind of like if you have, if you have a house and, you know, things are disorganized or there's um, 50 more of a certain item in a drawer, you know, it's cluttering up being able to find other stuff. That's the, the simplest analogy I can think of. Uh, and also I would say if people want to know more about uh, database and, and performance and well that, check out our previous episode here on uh, uh, Do The Woo. Um, so security and backups. Is, security is vital, obviously, right? So there are a couple of measures that the hosting do take to provide more security. Um, you, you're handling customer data and payments and all of that. So it's obviously very important. SSL, mandatory. That's not even the topic to talk about. Um, but backups are also very important, right? So, and backups are tricky because if you have a store that is running 24-7, which you have, obviously, and, and you have a lot of orders coming in and suddenly something happens and you need to restore a database, you're going to lose eventually some data, right? So there are some uh, automated backup systems that are more clever than others. But that's definitely something you need to worry about. And your hosting company will help you a bunch if they take care of that part. Would you agree, Mike? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I think any any host nowadays, need, like they know backups are so important and uh, they need to be quick. Like to be able to take a backup shouldn't take hours and hours. And uh, being able to restore a backup, you know, unless it's a massive sites, right? If it's a huge database, just inserting all those rows again, no matter how much, uh, uh, you know, CPU, uh, RAM, et cetera, that you have, it's just going to take time. But um, yeah, like you, without it, you know, and having those like hourly, some let you do hourly backup. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you have those, these different categories. Now we have hourly, you have daily, and then you have automated backups that if you do, uh, you know, push live to staging or you're restoring a backup, then the good hosting companies will take a snapshot before you restore that backup in case you're like, oh, oops, that wasn't the backup that I intended to, or this this uh, version of the backup didn't have the data that I wanted. Um, and then you have manual backups too, right? When you're going to do your uh, your updates for every month or every week, whatever you're doing before the plugins and stuff, you want to take a backup, you know, before plugin updates to in case anything goes uh, wrong. So. Correct. Yeah, snapshots are very useful. Um, having your backups done in a fast and, and quick way is also very useful. But also make sure that you at least um, check how to restore a backup, so not that you really have them. That's half of the uh, job when uh, things need to be taken care of and, and you have a problem, and knowing how to restore them quickly is as important as making them right. 
Yeah. I would also say that verifying that your backups are actually valid and work is should be part of every every store like annual um you know like testing that disaster recovery testing or whatever like because like oh we have a backup it's like have you ever tested any of your backups and people say no it's like how do you know that they work it's like a drill fire drill right in a big company you need to make them once or twice a year so people remember how to uh, escape and building when when the fire hits yeah the last point i would say is scalability um so um when your WooCommerce store grows, you need to scale it. Um, you might start with shared hosting, which is a term that we didn't use in this episode yet, but here it is. Um, but as traffic increases, you might want to upgrade to a VPS or even a dedicated server. And for large businesses, um, usually they use AWS or Google Cloud. Um, and often, um, they're, and they are often a good fit because they allow you to scale the resources up and down on demand, right? And almost instantly. So it is important to choose a hosting provider that can grow with uh, your store. And uh, so you're not stuck with the limits that may hurt, or then you need suddenly to hire somebody to take care and and, uh, move it to a different hosting, right? Um, How much is it important when people start out to choose a hosting company that can scale a lot? Or do you think it's important that they can scale a lot? Do you think there's a segment of hosting services that are more adequate for store store owners that are starting out and there's others who are more adequate for people who have already their business running what's your take on uh scalability uh it's a good question i think it's i think it's always a good idea to bet on your own success <laughs> you know like it's good to that's a pay growth unless you know for whatever reason it's a very small mom and pop store that sells you know lemonade homemade and there's a limited amount you're never going to um you're not interested in having many warehouses and selling to thousands of people every day um i think it's important to have a hosting company that will grow with you right um you know i i don't i'm sure you've experienced this too when when you have to move a client's woocommerce store from one hosting platform to another um people get nervous you know like a a lot of people have had a bad you know that migration sort of like trauma right where there was like oh something didn't work like they didn't check the php versions or there was something you know they're using they were using apache and moved to something using nginx and something really important broke or whatever um so i think it's it's a really good idea to pick a hosting company that doesn't only offer shared hosting but they have all different kinds kinds yeah yeah, you want to ideally keep the same IP address so you don't have to worry about DNS propagation stuff in case you grow and the good uh, hosting companies will let you keep the same IP because you can move an IP address from one machine to another, right? And, and then we fall back again to the thing that we talked about at the beginning of the episode, which is the support part, right? So when you hit the threshold and you need to upgrade to a different plan, I've seen cases where the, the hosting company would say, yeah, well, unfortunately, then you need to do this and you need to do that. And and they just took the the whole thing back to the client and said, now you need to go to this page and do this and, and uh, get this. That's that's not a good service, right? So if you're scaling, that means that the hosting company is a partner of that store and they need to scale with them as well. And they need to provide them all the tools to offer them a better service. And at the end of the day for the hosting company, it's a bigger invoice that you're going to pass through to the client. So it makes all the sense to say to the client, hey, you're growing. Shared hosting is not an option anymore. Don't worry. Let's um, schedule a migration uh, when you have least visitors coming in. And by tomorrow morning, when you wake up, you have a new uh, hosting service that will uh, accommodate for for your growth. And that's ideally the best hosting service that you want to have, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think we, you know, when we're offering advice uh, for clients, we usually want them to be prepared for the next 10, 20 plus years um, with whatever challenges they might face or uh, growth opportunities. Like you don't want them to miss out on something. So the, we, um, we have a handful of hosting providers we know can accommodate different types of stores and um, business models so that they will, because it's hard to find hosts that will do horizontal scaling multiple 
servers because usually the way that their internal database works is as soon as you've added a domain name that maps right to a specific server, like you can't add another one. Um, so even if you, you want to buy another, pay for another account and add another server, it just is like, nope, system says no. Um, vertical scaling is a lot more common. They're, they're usually happy to let you resize your server and make it bigger. But sometimes you want parallel processing. Um, some clients want uh, geo redundancy. So I have one that has servers in Chicago and in New Jersey, and there's a primary, secondary database uh, structure thing set up. So if Chicago goes down, New Jersey takes over, which is uh, which is really cool, right? And a lot of providers don't uh, support that kind of uh, stuff either. There are two other uh, little things that I wanted to add um, before we... Uh come to an end um and that is bandwidth although right now bandwidth is almost uh every not every but some of the hosting providers they offer unlimited bandwidth or at least um, scalable options that allow you to uh, add more bandwidth to your servers um but basically uh bandwidth is maybe a number that you could calculate by taking your average page size and if you get for example five let's say your average page size is uh, two megabytes and you have 5,000 visitors per month, and each visitor views a page at about an average of five, five pages, then you do that calculation and you can come easily to 50 gigabytes a month if you have these numbers. Uh, I've never seen a case where I had a, a client which the, the company or the hosting company said they are taking too much bandwidth. They're going to be charged for that. But that's something that people need to look out as well, right? Just to take a look at the numbers and see how much bandwidth you get with your hosting company. Yeah, I, I I can't remember the last time I've seen bandwidth limits on the hosting company. Like not, now, most of them have Cloudflare integrated, and then you know the a lot of the bandwidth is passed off to them. I, what I've seen more commonly is um, outgoing emails, right? Like um, if sometimes they they have a rate limit on how many emails can go out from their servers, or they think that you're site is under attack or malware of some kind or of a malicious competitors trying to figure out how many orders you have, right? Like the, the order number, any uh, stuff like that. So uh, that's something I see more commonly that that tends to be uh, limited or they have a monitoring enabled and they'll disable the outgoing emails, which is bad if you're running a sale um, and you know, you need that you want those emails to go out saying, Hey, like this is your purchase, you know, so the user can follow along with their, their order. Um, so that's important that if the, I think if the hosting company limits that, that they notify you. And if you're going to have a big sale that they remove that throttle, cause, uh, then, then it spirals into support tickets from your customers. What's happening with my order? Da, da, da. And it's just bad experience for everyone sucking up unnecessary resources. 100%. And lastly, if I, as a developer, can um, ask our f- fellow clients, um, people ha- running the stores and choosing a hosting company, please choose a hosting company that allows us to spin up uh, different environments, low, low-end environments like staging or performance environments or uh, whatever other types of uh, non-production environments we can run. Because we definitely, most definitely, will ask you, the, thir- the first thing we'll ask you, do you have a staging website? That's the first most famous uh, phrase a developer freelancer can ask a client right do you have a staging website and if one cannot spin up a staging website on the same hosting provider quickly to figure out something or test something or even for yourself you want if you want to upgrade to a new plugin or if you want to do something and improve your website in a certain way you need different environments and and most of the hosting companies do offer them but also look out for those if they don't charge you for the ones that are not the production level, because I don't think it's uh, reasonable to charge for staging environments if they're not publicly accessible, they don't have the same kind of um, traffic that production sites have. Um, and lastly, how do you monitor all of this? Um, hosting providers do offer dashboards where you can see the CPU usage, the uh, memory usage, this space, also bandwidth, PHP workers sometimes do also offer and you mentioned New Relic, right? So some of them also allow you to connect your New Relic or they offer a similar kind of tool that allows you to dig a little bit deeper into knowing which PHP 
um, tasks are running along or plugins that are consuming memory and all of that stuff. So having hosting providers dashboards is also something that you should look out for. There's so many things you should look out for, but I guess we've summed up on this episode the most important parts. Um, maybe we can bring somebody in the future to talk a little bit more about this, to talk about customer experiences and what people are actually contacting support to um, uh, ask questions about. And so maybe in a future episode, we will bring somebody to uh, share with us some of the most common stories around hosting and support and WooCommerce websites. Yeah, I think we'll find someone from who works with a hosting platform very closely and can offer sort of on the ground, you know, experiential stuff of what they see. Because we, we're talking from the freelancer side, so we deal with a certain pedigree of and quality of website that's getting a certain amount of traffic or has certain challenges, but it's all s- stores of all different shapes and sizes. Yeah. I mean, you, you can check, you can you can monitor through this hosting providers dashboard. You can have WordPress plugins installed. You can have server logs. Uh, you can have external monitors. But the support team person that is sitting in front of a terminal that only he has access to or she has access to and just types just wonderful comments that gives you immediately what the issue is with your website, that's what, what we're looking for. Um, Everything else is just something that we can install and check for ourselves, but they're never provide the same insights as uh, somebody who is on the inside of the uh, hosting provider and have this magic terminal that sometimes we would like to have as well, right? Yeah. And I think that um, if you had to pick between, you know, quality support or having an adequate tooling, which one would you pick if you had to choose? (laughs) You were asking it that. A developer guy, right? So I'm a big fan of the dashboards and I would like to have notifications, alerts, graphics, all sorts of things uh, at the tip of a, of a finger because I would like to constantly be monitoring those numbers. But for somebody who's running a store, doesn't have time to do this, the support guy, I think it's more important to delegate and to ask somebody else what's what's wrong with you. I know that I, if I spend 10 minutes on it, I would figure it out, but I don't have those 10 minutes. So yeah, I think for those who are very busy running the stores and doing contacts and figuring out the products and restoring uh, inventory and all of this stuff, delegating, having the support guide there ready is a lot more important than having the fancy dashboards with all the graphics. Yeah, and I think that's an important piece when we're recommending services. If they have a development team with the necessary skills to be able to do a lot of debugging, troubleshooting, right. like rough right. on their own, then the the tooling is more important, right? Having SSH, having New Relic and other, you know, PHP might have been those kind of tools to do your investigations. But if you are a store owner who is just starting out, you know, maybe you you hired a developer to build your site, but you don't have someone on staff to be able to uh, dive in when things are going wrong, then having support staff, because then the tools don't matter, right? It's like, giving me a, a spaceship and I'll be like, that's really cool, but I don't know how to, <laughs> how to fly the thing or make it launch or anything like that. So yeah, I think it, obviously having both, then you cover all your bases, but if uh, I'm thinking of the person who's just starting out. I would say the most successful clients that I've ever worked with are the ones who are not that much worried about those dashboards and fancy information. They are more worried about the people they work with. And so having a good, relationship and a partner that has good support is more important than than having the numbers in front of them. All right, everyone, that's it for today. Thank you so much for listening and tuning in. Um, this was, once again, uh, Mike and I talking about WooCommerce and performance. And we keep talking about performance and performance. It's important. I know um, we are probably too much a little bit into this subject, but we'll uh, have future awesome episodes ahead with different people coming in. We're going to talk about development as well a lot. So, um, yeah, tune in. Thank you so much for listening. And Mike, I talk you, I talk with you in the next one. Sounds good, man. Thank you. Thank you.